Let us bow in a moment's prayer, please. Now, Father, we thank Thee for the words that we have just heard, that scriptural song, Potter and the clay. Father, we pray tonight Thou will soften our hearts, quicken our spirits, stir our minds, expel from us every other voice that would clamor for our attention during this meeting, things of the past, things of tomorrow. Help us to focus on Thee and on Thy Word. Bring a hush, a hush, a hush of Thy presence upon every soul tonight. Amen. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 135. Just two verses tonight, which we will be referring to later on. The first one's in, in Psalm 135. And just open your Bible there at that psalm. And get the page ready there for when we turn to the Word of God. For over 40 years now, spiritual revival has been on my heart, on my lips, and on my very soul every day. There's not a day but I don't breathe, O Lord God, wilt thou not revive us again? The first thing I say most mornings when my feet hits the floor is, Lord, maybe today, when I walk down the lane and open the gates and go into the church, I cry so often, O Lord, how long? How long will it be until thou come and rain righteousness upon us? For the first ten years of my Christian life, I scarcely heard the word revival mentioned. In the circles that I moved in at that time, Good men, faithful men, men who preached on the great doctrines of redemption, atonement, justification, substitution, faith, the Lord's return, the Lord's table, the Lord's day, great preaching on those truths. But I am sad to say that I heard nothing or very little on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, revival, a spirit-filled life, and a deeper and closer walk with God. I was left to believe as a young Christian that when I got saved the end of May 1970, that that was the sum and total of my Christian life. 
What a wonderful day that was, the day that I was saved. There was no day ever like it, and there never will be any day like it. I could say indeed, all down through the years, like Charles Wesley, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, and I diffused a quickening ray, I woke the dungeons flamed with light, my chains fell off, and I was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom, no more in chains of sin I repine. Oh, how those courses and those hymns bless my soul after all these years. But as I went on in my newfound faith and got a job and uh, went about the Christian life the way I knew how, I broke bread, I gave out tracts, I went to prayer meetings, and odd prayer meetings, I stood in the open air, attended meetings and testified, preached wee bits, but I became terribly unsettled. I became terribly unsettled as a Christian. As I watched men and women who had a Nora or a glow or an excitement about them when you met with them. All they wanted to do was talk about the things of God and what God was doing in their lives and answers to their prayers and the experiences that they had as the Holy Spirit filled them and ministered to them. There was an attraction about those people. And then as I began to read about men like Finney and Moody and men who testified dozens and dozens of them to something after salvation, I became more and more hungry. After 11 years in, in, one, in the one employment, I left and went into Bible college. I was dry when I went in and I was drier when I came out. All the emphasis was on education, degrees and diplomas. The first time I applied, they asked me, had I any O-levels, of which I hadn't or didn't get any. And oh, how, how, how forlorn I felt. And I cried out from my heart one day, Lord, is this all that there is to the Christian life? Did I leave a good, well-paid job that I loved and sell my home, leaving my wife and two girls and family support and benefit, standing with a cap well down over my eyes in case anybody would see me in the labor exchange for weekly ration? waiting on some of my ex-Christian colleagues to come with groceries or something for us. I thought that that was all there was. Before I went back to the college in the third year, I said, Lord, you'll have to do something. They promised me job back my status and my job back, the place where I worked back within two years, and the two years were up. One day, with a heavy heart and a hungry soul and a Bible in my hand, I fasted and prayed and went out into the Rona Briars and Market Hill Forest Park. And there I cried unto God, and I said, Lord, I'm going back to my work. God took a mighty dealing with me that day. And something happened in my life that day that I never put tags on it or anything else, for we've called it everything in Northern Ireland. But I was filled and anointed and touched by the Holy Ghost that day. And all I can say is this, I had three great days in my life. The day I got saved, 
the day I married my wife, Pat, and the day that the Lord dealt with me and anointed me and filled me with the Holy Ghost, and what a mighty day that was. Ever since that moment, revival has burned in my heart and in my soul. I've studied hundreds of revivals and 50 revivals in depth. And I'm convinced with all my soul tonight that unless the wind of the breath of the Holy Spirit of God sweeps across our dying, decadent nation and church, we'll continue in the lawlessness, we'll continue in our deadness, we'll continue in our barrenness, our restlessness, and our shamefulness. And it's so sad tonight, as I look across the Christian church, to see so many of God's people with no passion, no vision, no burden, no shame. Many of God's people spend hours watching football games and soaps and social media, business and holidays and pleasure, with no heart for God, no love for revival, no love for the house of prayer. Oh, what sad days we're in. If ever we needed a breath of God, we need the breath of God today. Don't hear many people crying out like old, the old philosopher Dante, the French philosopher, he said, let my name be blighted, but let France go free. You know, I pray like that. I think of the ninth of Romans where Paul says, I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow of heart for my people. And he says, let me be accursed, Lord, if you're not going to deliver them and bless them. I think of Jeremiah and he cried out for these things, my eyes weep, and runneth down with water. Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears for the slaying of my daughter. People, I asked you tonight, do you think Christ died for the way the church is tonight? Do you think that he went to the cross and suffered all that to leave a church like we have tonight? And some of you people are tonight in this meeting. I don't think he did. I think of the desperation of Rachel when she came in before Jacob and said, give me children or I'll die. I think of Sam Hadley, the old drunkard and gangster who God saved, started that water uh, gate mission in New York. And police, some night says they found him holding on to the lampposts, weeping and crying. Lord, the sin of the city is breaking my heart. But not many Christians crying about the sin and weeping over the sin of Dungannon and Tyrone, and not many, that many, weeping over their own sins. I think of John Knox, the Scottish reformer, who one day in days cried out, give me Scotland or I'll die. David Ravenhill, whom I keep in touch with and preached twice on two occasions at the light, but told me that his father Leonard was the greatest model, the greatest man in his life for a man of prayer and a man of holiness. I tell you that's something for a son to say about his father. I wonder, son and daughter here tonight, can you say that about your father? I wonder, do you hear them weeping and praying and calling? 
unto God? Do you see them living a holy life? I heard Ravenhill, Leonard Ravenhill praying. On one occasion, he prayed, Lord, Lord, I'm ashamed to be part of the modern. This 30 years ago. I'm ashamed to be part of the modern, lukewarm, nauseating church. Lord, I don't want to make you sick. I don't want you to spew me out of your mouth. I wonder, are we making them sick tonight? Are we lukewarm? Lukewarm. In that passage that are quoted in Revelation 3, she says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock of any man. And it's my task tonight to close these meetings. And I ask, is there any man? Is there any woman? Is the day of the individual? Is there a man, is there a woman here tonight that's going to stand at the end of this meeting and say, Lord, I surrender all to thee. I fall at thy feet and I give my life to thee, thou art the potter, and from this moment on, I am the clay, mold me and make me. I pray that that will be the outcome of this meeting and tonight. I heard Tom Shaw saying one time that he spoke to a missionary. And a missionary, after years in the mission field, said to him, he said, I'm backslidden, I'm cold. I've lost the anointing. And he said, I would go home if it were not for the shame of it. I spoke to a man who was 28 years in a fundamental evangelical church as a minister. Spoke to him one day, I knew him for many years. And he said to me, Bertie, I have, I have two years to go and then they can keep the whole thing. I remember thinking to myself, what, what a wasted life. And he did, he did, and he retired. <laughs> within, within four years, him and his wife both were dead. I don't want to end up like that. I'm excited tonight of what God is doing and what he's going to do. I thank God for the movings and the workings of the Holy Spirit that we're going to experience. Now, I have two texts tonight, and they're strange texts. But God has laid them upon my heart and never preached from them before. The first one is in Psalm 135 and verse 7. Psalm 135 and verse 7. Now notice that he, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain, and he bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. In that verse there are three symbolic agents, an epit, an epit, 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 Ephesus of revival, Metaphors of revival. There's the fire, there's the rain, and there's the wind. Many scriptures will declare that these are three of the phenomena, phenomena of revival. The first great revival in the church on the day of Pentecost had two of them, the wind and the fire. And Elijah and Mount Carmel, the three of them were displayed, the fire, the floods, and the wind. 
So my first heading tonight, and I've only a short message. It's not the length of time you preach. Oh, friend, tonight, it's not more words we need to hear. Not more gospel you need to hear. It's not more messages on being filled with the Holy Ghost or surrendering your life you need to hear. What you need to do is to obey. Obey. The first heading that I have tonight is revive. We see revival descending. Look at verse six, the verse before that, verse seven. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and on earth and the seas and all the deep places. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that he did. Now watch verse seven. He causes the rain. He maketh the lightning. And he bringeth the wind. Revival is a sovereign act of God. He brings the rain. He brings and makes the wind. He causes the fire. Must always keep that in our mind. It's God. We can't sing it up. We can't work it up. We can't sing it down. We can't work it down. We can't pray it down. We can't fast it down. These are all components that are necessary for revival. But it's God's call at the end of the day. God is a sovereign God. He causes, not the Baptists, not the brethren, not the free churches. God, God causes the rain to fall. God, the, God causes, maketh the lightning. God bringeth the wind. Oh, I tell you, I wonder what the global warming crowd think of this. I wonder what they think of this verse, their cop-outs in G7. They tell us that the climate is all confused and disorientated and mixed up. The climate, they say, doesn't know whether it's summer or whether it's winter or whether it's spring. Oh, poor Mother Earth, she's dying. We need to give her the kiss of life. One day they tell us we're going to burn up. Another day they tell us we're going to freeze up. And another day they tell us they're going to soak up. Problem's not with the climate, the problem's with them. That 18 year old foul tongued Swedish, Thunberg, whatever you call her, set up as an, an idol, as an icon. My friend, God is in charge of the climate. God is in control, not Attenborough, holding a wee baby polar bear and weeping. If he'd weep over his soul, God bringeth the wind. Where does he bring the wind? Where does it say in our text? Out of his treasuries. Out of his storehouse. Out of his barns. I tell you tonight that God's storehouse is full. His barns are full. His treasures are full in heaven. Heaven's full of blessing tonight. It's full of glory tonight. It's as full tonight as it was in 1859 or 1904. It's as full tonight before the revival in Uzi Street or through Jeremiah Lamper in New York. It's as full tonight as it was in the day of the Moravians. The heavens are heavens full tonight. God's storehouse is full tonight, and He's waiting to open the windows of blessing. His treasuries are full, and He said He would open the windows, and He'd pour us out a blessing. God's not diminished in all the revival that's passed. It hasn't done drained anything out of heaven. Heaven is full tonight. Heaven is waiting tonight. God's waiting on us tonight. 
Maybe he's waiting on some young man tonight to rise up in this meeting or listening to me tonight that will go through with God and bring revival in into our land. He said, I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. But there's a stipulation. You always have to get the stipulations in these great texts that we quote. He, say, he, says, he says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now. Prove me now here with the tithes. Have you all your tithes in, believer, tonight? Are you given a tenth of your earnings and, your, and after that an offering to God every week? Or are you robbing God? He said, will a man rob God? You have robbed me. How? In tithes and offerings. Have you robbed God? There's no wonder you're dry and barren and cold tonight. But you don't only rob them, you know. We not only, you know, some of God's people spend more on cats and dog food than they give to God. He says, not only bring all the ties, but bring all your time. Someone said, you sleep eight hours, you work eight hours, what do you do the other eight? How many out of those 24 hours have you been before God? And your family altar and alone with God. You're asking now, you're talking about revival. You come out here to hear about preparing for revival. Do you want revival? Well, then you need to examine the time you twist and trigger at that old phone and internet and all the rest of it. Bring all your time that you can before the Lord. Bring all your ties, all your talents. Every man and woman, when they were saved, God gifted them. And he has gifted you and you have a gift tonight. Wherever you are, listen to me. And God wants that gift in these last days. And what about your tongue? You need to get your tongue on the altar, some of us. What about your temper? Ivan Thompson used to talk about those that are a holy Joe on Sunday and a holy Tar on Monday. We need to bring all the ties into the storehouse. We need to get down before God. We need to hold our clean hands up to the Lord and say, Lord, our land needs thee, our nation needs thee, our church needs thee. What can I do? Lord, you saved me. You lifted me out of darkness. You brought me into light. You give me love and you give me faith and you give me hope and you give me a family and you give me a job and you give me blessing, Lord. And I've done nothing over the years for you, only greed and pleasure. I was thinking today about the first revival in the church at Pentecost. There was a few things about that. There was the first of all, there was the promise of the Father. It was promised by the Father, and revival is promised by the Father. Jesus said in Acts 1, wait for the promise of the Father. What ye have heard from me. It was promised from heaven and anything God promises, he keep his promise. He cannot lie. He has promised me. He has promised us dozens of things and he's keeping them and he cannot lie. And then there was the promise of heaven. There was the praying people, 120 of them, gathered together in the upper room and they prayed and they cried unto God. Then there was the preaching of the word which we hold tight to in this, in, in, in our assembly, the preaching of the word of God. None we could go with the things that were done at Pentecost on that great day when the Spirit was poured out, but there was also the piercing of the heart. When they heard this, it says they were stabbed. That word pricked, they were stabbed as if a two-edged sword went into them, and they cried out, what do we do? That's conviction. 
That's repentance. That's brokenness. That's not standing up. That's not putting up your hand. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But that's, that's not repentance. It's not conviction. It's not brokenness. It's not seeing things the way God sees them. I pray almost every day, Lord, let me see what you see. Let me feel how you feel. When you see the church in the state of sin. What will we do? Go and be baptized, they said. You believe or not baptized? Time you obey them. Or else just throw the whole thing there and go on with what you're doing. Don't put a wee bit of religion into be coming in on Sunday morning. You'll be like the missionary. You're too ashamed. You were honest tonight. You'd say there's not a bit of light, there's not a bit of life, there's not a bit of love, there's not a bit of passion, there's not a bit of burden, there's not a bit of prayer. God hates it. And yet he's so patient. Go and be baptized. Go and make restitution. Go and make confession. Go and ask forgiveness. A young man said to me last Sunday night out, out in the outside, he says, I have restitution to make. I said, go and make it. And when you go and make it, God will bless you. He'll bless you. And so he did. Restitution. Given back to God. For about two years I worked in Kent Plastics and then a skilling. And I used to do night work so I had to go. And on the break at the middle of the night I would go into the showroom. We made all these plastic of 165 badges for masses, 135 badges for masses. I made the eagle or the whatever it is that sits up in the front of a jagger or that lion or whatever it is. I'm big, all over lovely. And then there's the wee GT pad. Went into the middle of the steering wheel. It said, lovely wee thing. Oh, it was the loveliest wee badge you've ever seen. So I took the GT pad and I took the, the jaguar badge and a couple of Massey Ferguson badges. Threw them into the car and went on about my life. Got saved. Moved house five times, six times moved house. Every time I moved house, I came across them. Never cost me a thought. Here was this big boy that had the, had the wee badge in the middle of the car, in the middle of the steering wheel. Stolen. Stolen. Never cost me a thought. Oh, I was going to prayer meetings. I was breaking bread. But you see, there was no conviction. And you examine your life tonight and your heart tonight and see if there are things in your life that there's no conviction. But I tell you, when God dealt with me 10 years, I went into that garage and I rooted out that stuff. And I gathered that badge, those badges up, and I brought them back. I brought back pencils, I brought back rubbers, I brought back rulers, I brought back jotters, I brought back books to the place where I worked. And I searched my heart and I said, Lord, is there anything else? And he says, there is. He says, you sold cigarettes out of a shop in Derrick only when you were about 16 or 17. Now, I'm not talking about doing a witch hunt tonight. There's things that I can't do. There's things I couldn't do. There's things I couldn't put right. But God showed me things to put right. And I went to that shop. And that man was a drunkard. He was an alcoholic. And he had lost a leg, amputated a leg. And he was sitting up behind the cash desk. And I remember well going into him. I hadn't seen him for years. He says, Ernie, one day I saw him. 
Two packets of cigarettes from your shop. And I says, there's a five pound note. And he started to cry. He says, I don't want it, but I says, you'll have to take it, Ernie. I'm having meetings out the road. And how can I have meetings out the road if God tells me I'm a thief? Oh, now is the Holy Spirit ministering to you tonight. What about the farm accounts? What about clocking in and clocking out? What about that stuff you've taken from work? You're looking for revival. What about forgiveness? No revival if there's no forgiveness. I was hearing yesterday or the day before about a young girl out her, in her 20, early 20s. She was sexually abused by her father for years, right? As from she was a child up into her teenage years. She took to the streets. She became pregnant. She was on drugs. Someone brought her into a gospel meeting, and in that gospel meeting she was, she was wonderfully and gloriously saved and delivered. And she wept and told the pastor afterwards about what happened and how her father had abused her and sexually abused her. And the pastor said to her, contact him, ask him for your forgiveness, and tell him you're saved. I tell you, I tell you, you want blessing? No blessing without forgiveness. God, the Lord said that, I'll not forgive you if you don't forgive others. So don't be thinking about blessing. She raked up an old phone number and she hadn't, didn't know if it was his number or not and she rang. And then she heard his voice on the end of the phone. She broke down thinking of all the abuse. He said, Daddy, I got saved. And I want you to forgive me for the things I said and thought about you. That the blessing came. You holding a grudge in your heart tonight. Revival descends. He causeth, he bringeth. But revival also ascends. Look at the text again. He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. It's the vapors going up. It's the vapors going up and collected in the heavens that bring back the rain. And can I encourage you praying people to keep the vapors going up? Keep the vapors going up. Unless the vapor, unless the vapor goes up and forms up and goes up until it's full, it can't be poured out. Are you sending the vapors up? Oh, on the ends of the earth, it says. And I believe tonight there's prayer meetings to the end of the earth. Never has there been a revival that I have read or studied. Never one of them but hasn't come about by intercessory, supplicatory, desperate prayer from clean hands and a pure heart. Desperate prayer. Holy prayer, holy hands held high to God. Lord, there's nothing that I know betwixt thee and me.
We sang open the floodgates. I tell you, when the floodgates open, there's going to be mighty blessing. Why don't you turn to one verse now again before we turn Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 6. Oh, God, soften our hearts tonight, Lord. Soften hearts in this place tonight, Lord, and those listening to this message, Lord. This is not just spending a Sunday night. Father, it's time for thee to work. Lord, let the Eastern meeting this message be taken serious. Lord, may this message and people know that it's from the heart of God tonight. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 6. The wind goeth toward the south. Let me stand up there a wee moment. Duncan Campbell, the vision he got in Joe Kerr's house in Lisburn Street, in that street in, in, in Lisburn, came down from the room you heard Alan telling it, I've read it many times, and he was able to say that God was going to move. It was him that prophesied the Saskatoon revival that you heard about last week. And if any of you get that book on the Saskatoon revival, get it and buy it because the whole part of that revival started with men and women making, making restitution, people in the church coming together and forgiving one another. That was the main theme of the part of that revival. And once that began to take place then, the outpouring of the Spirit came. But he said to Joe Kerr that day is going to be a revival that's going to start in the south. Watch the text again. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about into the north, not from the north to the south. God help us. With all our preaching and all our churches, there'll be a half a dozen Pentecost, a half a dozen Christian churches in this town. None of them have been out hardly any into this meeting, or we wouldn't be at theirs. I tell you, there's some healing to be done. Not from the north to the south with all our tracks and all our banners. In all our Bibles, in all our churches, in all our doctrines. But to the south, where across the south of Ireland tonight, there's wee hamlets and homes and meeting places where, where dozens of converted Catholics are meeting. They may not dress like we dress. They may not sing the songs that we sing. They may not even use the translations that we use. But I tell you, there's a hunger in their heart for God. They have no baggage. They have no ritual. They have no traditions. There's nobody saying, if you don't put a hat on you, you'll go to hell. They're walking in the light that they have and they're seeking God. And God will move among the Catholics. He'll move among the Catholics. Watch the text again. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returning again according to his circuit. I was asked tonight or chose tonight to preach on the wind 
of the Spirit of God. This is a whirlwind. The wind bloweth where it listeth. It tells us that the wind is a mighty wind. It is a Russian wind. I tell you, when the wind of God begins to blow, we'll know it. You'll not see it, but you'll feel it. Oh, how much more we could say about the wind, and the wind, and the wind will blow. And our brother was on this morning from the pulpit in the lifeboat about the south wind blowing softly. Well, let me tell you, the south wind is blowing softly. The south wind is blowing softly across Ireland. And because of our intransigence and hardness and coldness, we're going to miss it. In the 1859 revival in Kells that swept all round Ulster, hundreds of thousands of souls were saved, hit the shores of Fermanagh even in Tyrone. About 30 years ago, Eddie Ray, the late Eddie Ray and I had a mission in Clock. Not in Clock Mills, but in Clock, four miles or five from Ballymena. We went to the house for tea afterwards. And that gospel mission and the man were talking about the revival of 1859. He says the revival swept round through Clock Mills and Ballymoney and Cold Rain and right round a hockle and round never touched. Clock. Never touched it. Wasn't a move of a soul in the whole village and area of Clough. And he began to tell me why that was. He reckoned it was because there were those that opposed it. Well, certain people opposed it and said it was of the devil. You be very careful what you say. I tell you, I don't know where you will go tonight to get better preaching that you have heard here from these two men in the last nights. I don't know anywhere in the north of Ireland where there's preaching like you heard from them. I don't care what church you go to, what denomination you go to tonight, you'll hardly ever hear about revival. And you'll hear plenty about false fires. And there'll be plenty of singing and plenty of clapping and plenty of outward show. And they talk about revival, but it's not revival. That will come with revival. It may be, and tongues may come as well, whether you like it or not. Are you ready for the wind to blow whatever way God wants it to blow? He causes it. He'll send it. He'll bring it. And it'll not be in your dictate, it'll be in God's dictate. You just maybe have to leave your wee petty doctrines to one side and believe God. You see, one of the reasons that we never heard so much, any much about the revival, because revival is the Holy Spirit, and that men and women are not filled with the Holy Ghost, and they're not uh, anointed with the Holy Ghost, and they don't love the Holy Ghost and the things of God. They can't preach on it, and they won't preach on it, and so there's no revival. And if you're telling to me tonight that when you got saved, that is a whole business, and you just live as you like, it's a lie. Friend, it's a lie. There's a going on, and there's a going through with God. There's a joy. Why would there not be? Why shouldn't there be? Look at what we have. Sins forgiven, peace with God, assurance of heaven. Do you think he died for that? No, no. Maybe the soft wind, the, the south wind is blowing softly in your life tonight. And if you nourish that soft, that south wind, if, if you nourish it and you, you obey, then it'll get higher, heavier. And you know, it could turn into a hurricane.
Don't reject the soft wind of the Spirit that's blowing tonight when God asks you about forgiveness and obedience and baptism and membership and things of the church which you disobey. You can't expect blessing. He giveth the Holy Spirit unto them that obey him. And it's painful. I tell you, friend, I had to lie before God for days, 10 years ago, after 10 years been saved. I had to go around every nook and cranny to think of what I can do to make sure that everything was right between me and God. And I didn't expect the Lord to bless me until I was. Do you know after I'd done that, I went out into my first mission. Do you know in the first gospel mission I had, there was 11 souls saved. And every one of them went on with God. I tell you, I had got a new lease of life. I had got joy unspeakable and full of glory. I had got what God had for me, and I'm still getting what God has for me, and I'm still living in the good of it, and you'll never hear of me retiring. I will say to the lipos, I'll give it to them, and I'm away, <laughs> not at all. My heart is full tonight of the blessing that God's going to give to us. And it whirleth, that whirleth, the south wind is going to whirl right up to the north. And it's going to come round and round and round and round. And then it returns to its circuit again. And it has returned to its circuit tonight. Tonight the, the Ulster's dry tonight. But you know, the vapors are going up and they're being built up and they're being built up and there's wee drops beginning to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's wee drops beginning to come. It goes round and round and round. And then God takes it up. And then God sends it down again. That's been the history of the church. Only for revivals, the church would be extinct. Evangelism's not doing it, friends. Tracts are not doing it, good and all as they are. But it's so hard to watch the modern day evangelists slogging and slogging and slogging week after week and praying after prayer and see one soul or no soul saved. It's not right and it's not on. If you're content with us, all right. If you're content with your children going to hell. If you're content with them on drugs and on drinking, you can't go to the prayer meeting then. Let them go on to hell. But why should we care if you don't care? Why should we pray our hearts out three nights a week in the light but when you don't even come to pray for your children? I wonder how many of God's people tonight are watching the football match. I don't know what time is on. But I wonder how many of God's people are more interested in that tonight. And my friend, until that is broken, until God moves, until conviction comes, in individual lives it'll be no better. There'll still be the darkness. There'll still be the deadness. God's not a fool. These two tacks were laid upon my heart. I never preached on them before. I'm not even preaching on them. I'm only reading them. My heart's cry is for Ireland. My heart's cry is for an Irish revival. I don't know where your heart is tonight. I don't know what you've taken out of this meeting other than going home and saying he's golden again, he's tongue again. And my heart's full, I can't help it. I don't know barrenness and coldness and prayerlessness. 
Going in and out of meetings, dry as a bone, waiting to get home to see the news. Once you begin to put into action, when the wind begins to blow, as we've been hearing on other nights, and those mighty mountains from Alan and Stephen, when you've been hearing the hearing of the movings of the Spirit of God, if it doesn't move you tonight, if God has dropped one wee thing into your heart tonight by the Holy Spirit, then you need to obey that wee thing and you will then see the next thing. Obey is better than sacrifice. We'll sacrifice more and eat, but we'll not obey. We'll not obey. Our hearts have come very hard. And that's why I prayed at the beginning of the meeting after our sister sang, soften her heart, for thou art the potter. We are the clay, and he takes that lump of clay, and he squeezes it, and squeezes the wee bits, the stuff out of it, and puts it on the machine, and twirls it, and it's still not right. He throws it down, and he gets another one. So he has it perfect. And it's painful. And it's not easy. It'll not be easy to go to your boss. It'll not be easy. To go to your family, it'll not be easy to give back that money. In 1993, I see Brother John Kerr at the back and a couple others. We had a move of God when the when the the south wind began to blow softly. And I'm living in the good of that ever since. With all the readings of revival and all the hearings of revival and all the sitting under preaching and revival, oh boy, to see a wee taste of it. Nothing like it. Those nights the Holy Spirit came in until man put his hand on it. Restitution. There was a man, a member of the church at that time, and he'd went to trainer's scrapyard to get a gearbox. The boy said to go out the back, they're out the back. And he went out and he took two gearboxes and he paid for one. And he brought it home. And that night in the meeting, God convicted him. He went the next day and he got the gearbox and he brought it back. The old trainer was living at the time and he told the old man, says, you're the first man, first man that has ever come back here. Another man had borrowed a hatchet from a neighbor and he had put it in the shed and he had forgotten about it. He knew it was there and he should have brought it back. God spoke to him about the hatchet. Another fella, Queen's graduate. God spoke to him about stealing a bottle of lemonade from a woman's house when he was on his way to school. He had to go back. And as that happened, if people had stolen clothes out of shops, came to us and hadn't the money to pay for it, and the church paid for it, and as far as we could know, as the thing moved on, God was working. We thought that was the promise fulfilled. But it's going to come again. 
going to come again. I believe with all my heart. I wouldn't have these two men on the pulpit if I didn't believe they believed it. I'm tired of dead preachers and dead preaching and carnal preaching. I'm tired of getting things hammered into it and hammered into the young people and there's no life, no power, no anointing. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Another man, he was working for a man and he was drawn out by our manure on a link box. You think these are simple? Do you think these? But I tell you when God puts his finger on something, doesn't matter what it is. The things he might never put his finger on, the things he can do nothing about, and I know that. And he was drawing link boxes of dung from the manure farmyard into the man's fields. But as he went, he had to go past his own house to do it. And one day he dumped in a load of dung for the vegetables and come home and never told him. He'd have given him hundreds of them if he'd wanted them. God spoke to him about the link box loads of manure. You see, this is a holy God we're dealing with. This is the eternal Holy Spirit that we're dealing with, the mighty Holy Ghost, God, the sovereign, eternal God who searcheth the hearts of every man and woman. It's him we're dealing with. Oh, but such and such a minister say, you don't need, doesn't matter what he says. What's the Holy Ghost say? No, oh, but I'm not going to do that. I can. Well, that's all right. But you'll have to answer to God. Let us pray. Father, tonight, if we have, if we have been too hard and harsh, Lord, we ask forgiveness. But Lord, you know our heart. Lord, we have to rise to the state of the situation. We can't lock the people to sleep and tell them all's well, Lord. We could have hundreds coming in on Sunday mornings. We can have scores round the Lord's table. We can have all those things, our Father God, but no Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we want not to quench you tonight or grieve you or hinder you or vex you. For Lord, we read in your word that we vex the Holy Spirit, he'll come he come against us and fight with us, the blessed, lovely, soft paraclete of the Holy Ghost, the tender. Bird of God turning on us, we can't hardly take it in. Lord, search me tonight. Not the one beside us, Lord, not. Now, I'm going to do what Alan done, not because Alan done it. I don't usually do it. But the first step, whatever it might be, in whatever area of your life, is a public recognition before God. Why you can say, I go home before God and ask him, but there needs to be a public recognition. Nobody's going to ask you what it's about or anything else. Nobody's going to name you or ask you to pray or anything else. God's looking at down in this church tonight, this room tonight, and he's saying to you, 
as others stood Will you recognize tonight that you need? Are you like I was? Are you barren tonight and cold tonight? Do you recognize that? Are you saying to yourself, is this all there is in the Christian life? Going to meeting, dressing up on a Sunday. My friend is so, so far from the truth. I tell you again, heaven's full. God wants to pour his Spirit out on you tonight. He wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost and power. So with every eye closed, and this is not a peeping show, with every eye closed, You just recognize before God tonight that God has spoken to you. And just in the quietness, stand upon your feet.